Yeah, we're shifting gears a bit in comparison to, to yesterday. So moving from analyzing your code and, and compiling it and then optimizing the performance more to, to package in the software. And in particular, I'm going to talk about the, the Conda Forge package. And I guess the next talk following this one is then going to talk about Docker containers. And maybe as a start, um, I would just ask who's already familiar with Conda? So who's already using Conda in, in their workflows? Oh, that's good, right? So I can skip the talk. <laughs> you have like a, roughly 80% already using it. Who already created a Conda package or is contributing to a Conda package? Okay, one. <laughs> that's maybe not so good, right? So that's, that's the part we want to change. Um, my motivation to this, uh, I spoke the last time about the Pyron framework. With Pyron, we couple different simulation codes the simula and the, to build workflows. Obviously, the whole workflow is not so useful if you don't get the codes, right? So like the, the challenge is getting the codes there. We, we found the Conda Forge package managers. We, we use them, and the goal here is always to get better science, right? So like, don't let people in one scientific group being stick to one code just because it's compiled on their hardware. But let them try all the codes in the community, and maybe they find one which is more suitable for, for the topic. Right? Or as we heard in the first workshop, when people say, we have all these methods for doing DFT on very large systems and thousands of atoms are no longer a challenge. And we can make it easier to, to install these codes, to try them out, to, to benchmark them on the same material system to see, okay, what is required to, uh, to run these simulation and maybe get better science as an output. It's also somewhat related to, to the exascale computing in the way that we want to see how can we get exascale codes in there. I don't want to give the illusion that you can just install Conda packages and run them on the exascale, right? So that if you want to do big runs and you want to get the maximum of performance, it definitely makes sense to compile your executable locally and, and optimize it for the specific hardware. But to first try different executables and try different methods, that's really where Conda Forge can be helpful. So I have a couple of more questions. Right, so I guess what is the motivation there is really like, okay, how do you share code? Right? So I guess many of you, as part of this, this workshop as well, right, so we, we create new codes and we want to share them with our collaborators. Um, we then think about, okay, how many hours do we spend helping our collaborators to get the code to run? Maybe they have a new PhD student. We have to tell them, okay, this is how you compile them. This is how you do this. You need these libraries in this version. Right, so we, we all know the, the struggle. And then finally, I guess it's the question of how many kind of collaborations did we miss, that we didn't initialize just because uh, maybe our software is not so easy to install and it takes too long to get it running where we could have benefited in, in the long run. Right, and this is really the, the goal here. I hope that at the end of this week, we not only have one person contributing to a Conda Forge package, or like two with me, but we have some more people, ideally all of you, or at least all the ones who are using Conda, to create their first packages and, and submit them. Good. Yeah, I guess I already spoke a bit about the, the motivation, right? So we, we heard this a lot in workshop three. I'm very interested to build complex workflows. Complex workflows meaning we, we couple simulations at different scales, different simulation codes. I don't go into the details here. And then when I have these workflows, I like to run high throughput studies with those and, and analyze material properties like I show it here for the, the melting point. Right? So the, the challenge there was, how can we get the, the simulation codes to the people? How can we distribute them in an efficient way? And, and what are the, the utilities that are available there? And we also have to imagine, right? So we, we have this HPC community and we, we all run on big systems and we, we get used to this, but what a PhD student might know is just the app store, right? So where's the app store for material science? Where can we just click a button to, to get the application running on my cluster. How do I install software? And so that's we, we, we have to see that we are not in a vacuum, right? It's like compiling software is something that we did for 20 years or some people even longer. But maybe there are more efficient ways to do this or how we can distribute these tasks in the future. And so let's look a bit at how we do this at the moment, right? So you, you would maybe contact a person, you get the code. Getting the code is currently very easy, right? So we, we go to GitHub, we can download the repository, now we have the code. So then we have to install all the requirements. And maybe this is easy, but sometimes this can be hard because in particular, we, we have to find the specific versions of the requirements that we need and so on. And then we can come to compiling the software. And I just looked at my favorite DFT code, right? So the, the VASP code. And they have this very nice line here, take the one that most closely resembles your system. That's not very easy for like a new PhD student to start out and say, okay, how do I identify what is my system? <laughs> right? So they have a lot of config files. Presumably they have the one for your hardware, but you still have to build up a lot of understanding. And I guess we as community have to ask ourselves, is this the stuff that we want to teach our students? Right? So how much time should our students spend on understanding 
which compiler to use. And we know all the edge cases, right? It's like, when does it make sense to use an Intel compiler on AMD hardware just because we want to compile a, a DFT code? And then all these special cases. Another me metric might be to just look at the number of pages for, for installing the software. Right? So I just go to the, the particular pages and click print to just get a, a measure of how long these explanations are. I'm not saying that longer is better, right? So I, maybe <laughs> there is an advantage to, to make it concise, but I'm also not saying that this, the shortest one, which in this case is a, a code at my previous institution, is the best one, right? So we really have to find some, some balance there. All this just to highlight, even though the, the code is available, it's not so easy for people to get started with the new simulation code. And getting started just means to, to execute the examples. And I guess we also have like different roles of people who are interested to get the code, right? So we as developers, we say, okay, that would be great if, if people use our code. And if you're very lucky and we have a, maybe a good numerical library, we can get the hardware vendors like, like, like Cray to adopt our code and say, okay, we ship this code directly with our distribution. But even for something like LAMS, I guess it's more on the, on the HPC center side that they say, okay, that we, we see a lot of users with LAMS, they compile the code. Or you maybe have some, some senior person in your group or like a professor who says, okay, they sit down, they compile the executable, and then the whole group is using it. And then we have the PhD student, if they have to, to compile it, we find that they have rather different interests. Right? So like, as a developer, I might be interested in getting the optimal performance of my code using most of the features, while the PhD student said, oh, it's good enough, right? <laughs> it's working, I can finally do my simulations. I just compile it once, maybe it's not so optimized, maybe it's not using the hardware acceleration that the soft code offers, but it's just running and I'm fine to, to finally do my calculations. Maybe where we waste a bit of the, the benefits where the, the developers maybe spend a lot of time optimizing for certain hardware architectures, but the student just takes the first make file that works and just runs the code like this. All right, so what I want to highlight here, in contrast to commercial software where a lot of pre-compiled executables are available, we rarely publish those as scientists. Right? So I'm not advertising that we should all go to commercial software. I still want you guys to release the code openly so that we can all collaborate on it and, and modify it. But maybe in addition to distributing the code, we can still also provide pre-compiled binaries as like an easy way for people to try our codes and, and play around with them. Right, so that's a bit of the, the motivation. I will now go into the, the user's perspective, which I guess I don't have to go too much into detail because many of you are already using Conda, but just let me give a, a very brief overview. Right, so the Conda package manager, there's this very nice blog post explaining how Conda came up and, and why they created this. The short summary of this is compiling NumPy from PyPy Py Py is very difficult because you need to link to the numerical libraries and they can be hard to compile on, on the different systems. So they looked for a different package manager. They didn't find anyone which was sufficient for, uh, sufficient for their needs and then they designed Condor to really first link C and Fortran libraries to Python codes. That was the initial motivation. By now it has really been extended to support many languages. It runs on all the three major platforms and supports a wide range of different um, hardware. And we're going to talk about the, the hardware parts and what this means for us as, as like releasing the software um, on some further slides. Right, so we have the x86, but we're also the ARM, PowerPC CPUs, and so as there's more and more support coming for the CUDA GPUs, um, it could be a bit better supported because I still struggle to build Conda packages for CUDA GPUs, so maybe that's something I have to talk to the, our friends from NVIDIA. Good. The advantage from the user side really is we don't need root access, right? So in comparison to like a, a Linux distribution, when I say, okay, I want my own Linux distribution, I might have restrictions on certain hardware, Conda, we can just install in our user directory. There's no limitation there. And in addition, we can have not only one Conda environment, but we can have multiple Conda environments. So this in particular was very useful when we switched from Python 2.7 to Python 3, and we, we had to migrate the packages, and some packages already supported Python 3, while others were still limited to, to, to Python 2. And I guess for, for the HPC community, it's luckily already available on most of our clusters. Right, so you these days find basically Conda distributions on many clusters already. Um, a bit of the distinction of the names, right? So there you might have heard different terms. Anaconda is basically the commercial provider and the, the main host for, for the package repository. I'm not going to talk about them. Um, you find information on the internet. Bioconda was the, the initial use of, the, of this Conda repository, primarily focused on the, the life science community. And now Conda Forge is like a, a general open source community. So I will focus on the, the later two there. In general, 
the quick summary is like Conda is just a, a package management solution to distribute the pre-compiled binaries um, on, on different systems. Talking about BioConda, it's hard to find a, a comparison of, of different package distributions and, and different choices there. I found this paper, but it's already outdated, right? So 2018, it's already some time ago. And in particular, at this time, Conda, uh, BioConda was, was still pretty young. When we saw it within a short time, they really were able to migrate a lot of the, the life science um, packages to the BioConda channel, right? So it's in comparison to, to other package distribution channels like the, the Debian or Gentoo or Homebrew is here as well, right? So it was much easier to, to get move packages to Conda Forge and then run them there. By now, they, they move far beyond the, the 2,000 that they had in, in 2018, uh, and there, there are over 10,000 packages in, in the BioConda repository alone. And we also have the, the age comparison. So when they published the paper, BioConda was still very young, so I guess it's two or three years old. By now, they, they gained a bit in age, but that also means that the number of packages grew. I still believe that they are the, the largest repository. I haven't repeated the study to, to get the numbers for, for the other sources. But I guess the, the first notion here is that Bioconda very, very quickly grew to become the default resource in, in the life science. And if you remember the talk from the third workshop um, from Johannes talking about the SnakeMake repository, right? So I guess the, the unique situation in, in the life science is that they have bioinformatics people and lab scientists who have to work closely together, right? So the bioinformatics people develop the software and then the lab scientists mainly apply the software to analyze the experiments. So there's a much clearer divide or much closer collaboration between the theoretical work and, and then the, the experimental application. So they also need a way to, to distribute the executables and make those accessible in their community. Then we have the, the Conda Forge repository. So Conda Forge is now the idea to provide one channel for, for all general software packages. And there's currently a, a bit of a migration from moving BioConda packages now also to, to Conda Forge. Um, if you want to use this, after you download Conda and inst install it, you can just add the Conda Forge channel. If you then set the priority to strict, it will always use this channel. And, and that basically allows you to, then whenever you call Conda install, you directly get the package from Conda Forge. So it's rather simple right, so to join this. And I guess most of the people using Conda will now also use the, or already use the, the Conda Forge channel. Right? So become more or less the, the default resource. I guess Conda Forge by now has over 20,000 packages in that channel, so that's even more, and they're a bit distinct from the packages in the, in the BioConda channel. Um, a couple of advanced tips for, for users that, that you might want to use. It, it makes sense to check that all your packages come from one channel. We will go more into the details of what it means and, and how channels can be different in, in the few further slides, but you can validate this just calling the, the conda list command. It also makes sense to, you can specify which version of a package you want to install. You can specify this in terms of the, the version number, but in particular also in terms of dependencies. So if you want them with open MPI or MPish, because that's the, the part where Conda can get a bit annoying. If you're switching from one MPI interface to another MPI library, it will update a whole lot of packages that are linked to one or the other. So that can be a very tedious update. In the same way, we can fix this, right? So to prevent our code from switching from one library to, to another, just because it found another way how to resolve our dependencies, we can say we, we pin this package, and pin means we always want to keep lamps coming from open uh, MPI channel, independent of, of the version here, denoted by the star. And in particular for cluster installations, it makes sense to Conda clean all. So Conda was designed to be able to switch very quickly between different channels. So they keep the, the downloaded packages um, in a cache. And, and then when you install a new repository, you can just use it from the existing cache, or if you switch between versions, they can just use the local cache. On an HPC system where you might be limited in the number of files that you are allowed to have, this command can be very helpful and can really save you from, from running into quota limits and other things. And then finally, if you're spending too much time installing too many Conda packages and your environment gets very complex, it makes a lot of sense to, to switch to the Mamba package manager. It's a drop-in replacement, so all the commands that work for Conda also work for, for Mamba, and then Mamba is written in C++, so the Conda package manager was written in, in Python. Mamba is written in C++, so the re time for, for resolving the dependencies um, of your different software packages is much faster. There is work in the, the Conda community to get the solver from Mamba back into Conda, but this might still take a bit of time, so in the meantime, it makes sense to, to use Mamba for, for the installation. 
All I want to highlight with this is really, Conda is not perfect, right? So there, there are the challenges, but there's an active developer, uh, the active community of open source developers really contributing to the project, which makes it for me the, a very ideal package manager to, to use for, for my own software and to distribute the software. So talking about this, um, when I started, there were a couple of packages from material science. So I, maybe some of you know the PhonoPy package or, or the PyCalpha package, but the main packages in, in the community were really just for general numerical parts. So we, we see NumPy here, this is one of the first, and then PyTorch, TensorFlow, so the machine learning community had already adopted it, which were packages that I was using, um, but then the rest wasn't so much so useful for me. And then we really started to, to put a lot of packages in, I guess the, the first one, one of the first ones being the LAMS package, which by now has, has over a million downloads. So it's really grew in popularity, and I'm not the only one using this, but there's also a huge series of other packages. Maybe you know CP2K, Quantum Expresso is on there, and, and many, many others. So to really be able to install the codes and play around with them, maybe there's a new feature in this code I want to try before really spending the time of compiling it locally. All right, so again, to emphasize this, I don't recommend that you download the Conda executable and run high throughput studies of thousands of calculations. It's really more for downloading the software and playing around with it if you should invest the time to then compile it locally and then run the, the large studies. And I guess we, we by now got some momentum, so more and more people on more and more software packages that we see being released then also make it onto the, the Conda Forge channel um, within like one to three months after the, the paper was released. So really, there seem to be, the, the community is asking for this and then the developers make the move and really get their packages also listed on Conda Forge. And with this, I think Conda also became the, the default solution for, for the field of material science. We now have a sufficiently large number of, of codes available there that we can just insert. And I guess, at least I, I haven't heard from, from people now using Homebrew or other package managers to, to get started. It's really the, the best experience was <laughs> when I was uh, at a conference in, at the beginning of this program when some person came to me and said, oh, they installed LAMS the default way. And I wondered, okay, what is the default way? And the default way was Conda for them, right? <laughs> there are already people, PhD students starting out, they just say, okay, the default way for me is to put the package into Conda, and if it downloads, I'm fine, right? So they, they don't even think about the, the, the need to compile it anymore. We can also look a bit at the numbers. So, so I, I just pulled up my statistics of how much I, I contribute to the Conda package, um, where we see this over 500 packages. What I found interesting is the, the amount of downloads is, is increasing nearly linearly or exponentially here, um, over 100 million downloads. So there's really a huge amount of people using these packages, but we also have to be very open about this, right? So there are a couple of packages in the million number of downloads, and there are many others who are maybe shortly above 100, right? So <laughs> there's a definitely a distribution of these packages and, and how, how they are aligned. But I think in, in general, the, we, we can make the statement that a huge number of, of researchers is using this, and I guess we, we also saw this here in the room. We really have many people um, working already with Conda. So now we come to the technical part, right? So we, I guess in terms of the, this, this talk, I really want to give you a bit of an introduction how Conda works, and then really show how we can build our first packages. And maybe you already heard this, right? So it works on my machine. So I wrote a new, new C code. I can compile it on my machine. If it's not working on yours, then maybe you did something wrong, right? So it's, it's not my fault. Um, different Linux distributions store the libraries in different locations, right? So like if people hard code where they expect a library to be, maybe that's not the same on, on your system or on your cluster. Um, in terms of Conda, what, what is that? Like, I, I just, in a very abstract way, right, and a very simplified way, you can think about a Linux distribution as you have your kernel, that's the part that talks to your hardware, and then on top you have, have different libraries, maybe you have your, your desktop interface, and then some system does some networking, some, some disk I.O. and so on. What Conda does is just starting at, at the lib, libgc. Right? So we, we start at the libgc, and then from there, all the other libraries like MPI and so on are all compiled in Conda, being compatible to this libgc that comes with Conda. Right? So it's really starting at this point, and then everything on top is really built with these libraries provided by, by Conda. You also have to imagine that different CPUs might have different instruction sets. So if you get the latest and greatest CPU that you just bought the new laptop and compile an executable and you try to transfer it to a different workstation, maybe they use different instructions there. So I wasn't aware of this, right? Before you compiling the Conda packages, I always said, okay, I just put both of these to native and everything was fine. But obviously if you want to compile an executable which is transferable and useful for other people, 
you have to somehow specify what is the, the number of, or what are the instructions of my CPU chip that I want to support. And there are two options, and I'm definitely not an expert in how to specify them. I just looked them up, how, how they are specified in Condor. So they compile with, uh, to, to no corner as, as the M arch, which means this code at least runs on, on CPUs from 2004, right? So there's a, quite a lot of, of backwards compatibility, close to, to 20 years. And then they, the second optimization, they run best on CPUs from 2014, right? So there's like 10, 10 years back, that's really the, the instruction set that they're optimizing for and to, to get the best performance. These are the, the two options. And that really makes the difference from, com if you compile the software and you just say, okay, I just compile locally and optimize for my local hardware, you have this issue if you transfer to a different system, you might, it might not work. If you compile to, to a general reference or like always is the same reference, it at least works on all, all these CPUs and all those systems. And then finally, if you have different library versions, obviously that can also lead to, to conflicts in, in your package and, and be different there so that by, by they start really at, at libgc and, and Conda, and this also when coming back now to, to, the, to the different channels, works best if you install all the libraries from one channel. So if you get everything from Conda Forge, starting at libgc, all the way up to, to your code, for example, LAMPS, then you can really be sure that, that the Conda makes sure that the libraries are really compatible to each other and all compiled in, in reference to the same versions. So Conda really starts there and provides a self-contained lightweight environment for the scientific applications. Maybe I keep this very brief, right? So the comparison, how is Conda different for, from, for example, containers? I say in, in a container would be like an, an operating system uh, level virtualization. So they share the kernel between the solutions, but then build all the libraries that I showed before, right? So the communication, the user management, and so on. Those are still included there. Well, Conda really just focuses on the libgc. Um, Conda images can be transferable, right? So there's the, they, they can be using the same techniques that we showed here. If you compile your Conda image on, on old hardware, it most likely also runs on newer hardware. If you build your Conda image on a, the very latest hardware, it's most likely also restricted to the latest hardware. Um, I, I've seen some claims that where people say, oh, my Docker container is more quick or quicker than the native system. The way they do this is by compiling the, the Docker container with much more recent libraries and compare it to a rather old system underneath. That can be somehow a, a bit tricky in terms of the comparison. I'm still a fan of uh, installing everything in the system or, or using Conda, really having the flexibility to install it locally because it saves us this layer of additional communication layer when we have to go logging into our container, bridge the gap in particular. If we now think about, again, the, the simulation protocols that I started with, we, having this additional layer makes writing the protocols and then coupling codes even more complex. Good. All right, so uh, for web applications, I definitely see Conda as, as a solution. For, for Rayleigh and scientific applications, I really prefer uh, to, to put it in, into, into Conda packages and have them all running in the same environment. Good. Talking about the developer's perspective, right? So I hope so far I was able to, to motivate you why Conda is useful. I already showed you how, how to use it and give you a bit of a better understanding how it works behind. Now we really want to get our hands dirty and start playing around with it. This is a bit of overview, right? So it's not so hard to create a Conda package. During this long-term program, I created quite a couple of those. Um, you can maybe connect those to, to different kind of, of topics that we had during the workflows, right? So generating structures to test different machine learning potentials, fitting machine learning potentials. We, we had to add some more parses. We learned a bit about Gaussian modeling and then also the, the Flux Research Manager, which is now one of the, the core components of the um, workflow group that, that I'm involved in. Right, so it's really, it's easy to get packages in, and I, I want to show this live in a few minutes. Um, yeah, currently about, like, currently I do once per week, right? So I, I find a package where I say, oh, that would be nice. I compile it locally. I say, oh, that might be useful for other people as well. And then I just put it in, right? So like to, to continue to grow this, and if we can get more people who say, oh, I found a nice package and I get it in, included into Condor, that would be very helpful. And the, the nice part here is, which I feel may makes Conda very easy to join, is really that everything is available on GitHub. Right, so they have a, a GitHub organization, and, and we, we can jump right in and, and see this. So I guess we are now like half through to the talk. I can do the, 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 the second part, we can do this live, right? So we, can, we could do a, a Conda package together, or maybe I do the Conda package and you guys give, give me tips what I do wrong. <laughs> 
Oh, I also have it in slides. Who would be interested to just see this live and then see how you can create your first package? That sounds good. Good, then I try this. I haven't practiced it, but I should have enough routine <laughs> to show this. Otherwise, we go back to the slides, right? So if this is not working. Um, so we just go to our Jitter profile, and then we can just go to Conda Forge here. I make this a bit larger. So for the first package, We can just start doing everything in the browser. Obviously, there are certain command line utilities which make it easier afterwards, but just to get you into the feeling of this. When you go to the, the Conda Forge organization, um, you find a, a wide range of repositories. The one that we most care about is, is the stage receipts. So that's how you submit new packages to Conda Forge. You can also find Mini Forge, which is like a, a very small Conda distribution. So these days, I wouldn't install the general Anaconda package, I would just install MiniForge directly. That already comes with the ConderForge channel configured. They have a website, which we can also take a look at. Right, so this website, you can take a look at it afterwards. But that's basically also available here. We, we have the feedstocks. Feedstocks are the, the individual packages. We look into this once we created our own. ConderSmithy is something we interact with, and, and many other repositories. I don't go into the details here. So we now start here. And the first step is we, we would just fork this repository. And I now hope, yes, sufficient to just fork the main branch. This takes a second or two. Yes. In this repository, there's already an example receipt. So there's a, a lot of things in Conda use the, the GitHub continuous integration environment. In particular, they use the, the Microsoft Azure Cloud. There's no need to be, build anything locally, so it can all be done in the cloud. And so the only folder that we have to care about is really this recipes folder. And luckily, they already have an example here. So that's what we see here. We can now just, I guess we just copy this. I just copy the example, and then we go back here and create a new file. So we start from the example. We give it the name of the package, and I choose my, my favorite package, which is already on Conda, but we will just create a, a new pull request to, to put the same package in there. And then the, the files which describe the package, the, the, the meta information for the package is just named meta and is following the, the YAML format. So here, just copy the, the content of the example, and we can go through it um, together. All right, so we can say, OK, we, we don't need the comments, or know what's in there. We can put Pyron in there. Now, I don't know the, the version number of the Pyron package, so I will just look this up again. So I can go here. Or we can even, maybe you don't, you're not the developer of the package that you want to add, so you maybe want to go to, to PyPy. And for getting PyPy packages into Conda, that's the, the most easy way. We will also afterwards look into like a, a C++ package and, and how this is done, but just to show it for a PyPy package as a first step. So we can here take a look at the package. We, we see the version number. So that's the same version number that we now want to have for our package here as well. So I can put the, the version number in here. As you see, already the default URL is you, it's downloading from, from PyPy. So we can keep this rest, uh, this, this part, and, and we delete the rest. right? So you can also build it directly from GitHub. If you store your source somewhere else, you, you might want to adjust the, the URL here. The next part is to, to be sure what's inside our package. We have a hash, which is basically comparing the content of the package um, with the one that the Conda Forge is downloading. If the hash doesn't match, it won't start building it. So here we can go to PyPy again. We can go to download files. We can view the hashes, and we just copy the first hash. And I go back here, put this in, and then we can close the, the PyPy page. OK, you can also obviously get your hash using the OpenSSL library. I don't go into the, the details of this part because we already got our hash. Um, if we build the package, we would typically have like a, a build.sh script, so a shell script to do the, the build process. For PyPy, that's very easy, right? So we just get our Python executable and install it. And because it's just a single line, rather than having an additional file, we can just use the, the script tag here. And so we here just keep the defaults and, and merge it in. What is maybe interesting, so you can add these skip parts and maybe even skip for a specific system. So maybe I could, could say my, 
I don't want to support Windows or my code doesn't support Windows, so I can add an additional flag and say, okay, please don't build on Windows, skip the build here. At, at this stage here, we, we, we don't need this, but you might have like a, a scientific code written in C or another language which might be harder to compile for, for Windows, so we might want, want to add this there. Yeah. Sure. So, so the skip truth means it skips something and then it reads the comment to figure out what to skip. Yes. Okay. Yes. So there, yeah, there, there, there's obviously more explanation. So the Condor Forge has a, has a docs page. Um, there, there are more details here, but uh, I, I will just go, go make it a bit quick to, to go through, through the individual parts, but you, you find answers for, for all these, um, in particular in the, the maintenance documentation. But yes, uh, it's reading the comment and basically identifying um, what you specified behind there, and there are certain keywords like skipping certain Python versions, or you can skip the different operating systems, and I hear there's also the, the link to, to explain this. Okay, we did this part, good. The next step is, is the requirements, and as we can imagine, we can have different requirements at, at different stages. There are certain requirements that we only need during the build process, the typical example being the compiler, you need the compiler to build the software, but you don't need the compiler to, to finally run your code. So this is, if it's a Python package, we can remove this, but here you, you would have your, your C, C++, or, or Fortran compiler. Um, on the host, we, we need certain packages. In particular, we need Python and pip. Host, in this case, means these are packages which are available during the installation, as well as finally when we run the code. And then we have packages during the run environment. As we're using pip to, to build the package, it's sufficient to just add our dependencies in the run environment. So now I go back to the Pyron repository, and because the Pyron package is more like a, a meta package, which basically just has a single dependency, as we can see this here, um, it's basically just including the, the Pyron atomistics package, and we primarily update the Pyron atomistics package, and the Pyron is just basically an, an overlay on, on top. So we can just copy this here, and then in the YAML format, it would usually just have a single equal sign. Good. In addition, after you compiled your package, and which presumably is more, more complex than just installing a Python package, you would also want to do some tests, right, to make sure that it's really working the executables that you build. And for a Python package, the, the first simple tests are really just, you want to be able to, to import it. And they also say you can also import certain tests here. And then something very useful for Python packages is also to check if the pip dependencies still match. So whatever I define in my um, setup.py file can be validated uh, with this part here. Finally, we can add additional information which would just generate the, the, the meta information. So this could be like a URL where people can find out more about your code, a short summary, what is your package, maybe a longer description of, of what exactly you try to do, and obviously the, the license information. So Condorforge works best for, for packages, or it's basically only designed for open source packages, and I guess Alex can tell us long stories how difficult it is to get a commercial package to build with Condorforge dependencies. So that's another argument to release your code as open source to really make it accessible for the whole community there, right? So um, yeah, we, we just keep the open source license, we can keep that part. I don't update the description now. Obviously to, for Condorforge, they, do, they have a, a review process which we will see in, in a moment. They want you to include the license file also in the package when you release it, right? So that everybody who wants to play around with the package, when they download the package, they have the option to, to validate that they are able, allowed to run this. Um, I guess that's maybe in the scientific community not so strict, but on other parts there, there can be difficulties if you have a license that doesn't match or if you have different licenses included in your dependencies and so on. And finally, we want to add our deep, um, maintenance. So here I could just add myself, um, just as add your GitHub username and your already there. Good. We removed the last couple of lines. 50 lines, that wasn't so hard, right? So, and that's all we need for a pure Python package, right? So I um, add package, and I maybe create a separate branch, and this Pyron, and I can propose the changes. Now we want to be a bit careful, right? So by default, it would just open the pull request to the main branch on my own fork. It's not what I want. I want to make the pull request to their repository. 
I can do so. I create my pull request. And that's already a part, right? So like doing this on GitHub, you get all the information of the steps of what you should do, right? As a reminder, what did we do? We have a title that's meaningful. Yes, I guess add Pyron is, is a meaningful title. We made sure that the license is included. Again, right, so they have to guarantee that they only publish open, open source code, that they are not allowed to release commercial codes there. The co source is official, yes. Package doesn't run the other packages, yes. We, we just agree to all these. The, the build number, so the build number is what we would use if we change something on the Conda package without changing something in the code. So for example, this could be like updating dependencies or using a new, new version. Those will always be the steps where we increase the build number. Here at this point, we just created the package, so the build number is zero. Town archive. The GitHub users, yes, I'm, I'm willing to do this, and I'm not in trouble. Good. But I still made something wrong, because somehow it made the pull request to my main branch, even though I tried to change this. We try this again. So we open a new pull request. <laughs> Was fine. Oh, that's what I wanted to do. Yep. Try this again. That. What am I doing wrong now? That should work. So I'm just confused because usually it should start now. The. That's coming. Yes, exactly. It starts now doing the, the continuous integration, and we already got like our first check that failed. The Condafort robot identifies there's already a, a receipt existing with the same name. Yes, the, the Pyron package is already there. Um, so that's like uh, one thing that I really enjoy about Condor. They use a lot of this, this kind of automation. There are a lot of robots coming with the Condafort organization. We as humans don't have to go in there and say, oh, this package already exists. But you basically directly get the message back. They, they check on their, their package index, see this is already existing. Um, the, the more interesting part is now what, what's happening here. Right? So they really try to install the package and, and run through the process there. So if you want to now understand, right? so for a Python package, that's not so challenging. But maybe if you have a C++ package, the, the build process can be more complicated, in particular, compiling to a specific reference architecture. Right? So we can now go for, for details and look into this here. And that's really just using the, the Azure Cloud. You can also see that the, the CUDA builds, by default, they're not activated. And we can jump in here. So the, the way how they do it is basically they, they build a Docker container, and then in the Docker container, remove all the dependencies and only use the dependencies um, that are specified inside Conda to really make sure that your library is not linking to something external, but really just using resources from Conda. I can try to make this a bit larger. Maybe this goes, oh, it's the wrong one. Let's see. Yeah, we see that it's, it's the build process part. I guess it's not still getting the, the environment ready, doing some updates, doing some downloads. Thought there was some other way to just see this one part, but you can also already see that it's building the the different operating systems at the same time, so we will also get the information if it's working. What it will now do is it installs all the dependencies that you specified in, in your meter file, right? So like download all the dependencies. So if we look very carefully here, we should find the Pyron Atomistics package. No, oh, maybe not yet here. No, then it comes in the next stage. Good. While this is running, maybe are there any questions so far to the process of, of creating Conda packages? Is there anything we, which was not clear uh, about it? Yes? Uh, is there a way to locally debug the meta YAML files without pushing them to Azure Cloud and kind of have all your builds fail in public? Uh, yeah, there, there is a way. Um, I guess there's a, a local build script. Okay. Um, I just have to admit that because I don't have three machines available directly on my fingertips, I like to just put them in, in the cloud and see them failing there. 
and then iterate there. So you, you, you can definitely try it in the first part, but just as open the pull request, they won't. Yeah. I guess it's, it's what many people do, do just to. Let me see if I refresh this. Should be there in a second, so it's now downloading stuff from Condor. Is, is there a practical limit on what they'll allow you to do, build tests on in the cloud? I mean, if you had some... Uh, the, the practical limit options. is something I'm not sure about. But it's like absurdly large. Two hours and longer. Right, so like, I don't want to let you run through a LAMS build in the cloud. Obviously, the cloud resources are not as powerful as our local computers, but we can, we can definitely run, I guess, I guess LAMS runs for something like, like and we, we, we can take a look. Right? So that's maybe also a big advantage. So if you, if you go to Condor Forge, yeah. right, and then we can just, just search in the organization, search for your pack, favorite package or a package which might be very similar to your build process. Um, you want to search for repositories. We find the LAMS feedstock here. Um, you can directly take a look at what do other people do to build their package. Right? So I can, can already see, okay, that might be a similar package. That might also be a package using CMake. If we click in here, we see there are a couple of more files. Um, in particular, we have the, the build.sh script, which is, is more detailed because now we need a shell script to, to build LAMS. We select all the different LAMS sub packages that we want to include. Again, the philosophy here being we want to include as many of these sub packages as possible for, for the people to try the executable, play around with it. And then we have certain parts. So for certain of these packages are not available on all architectures. So for the, there's not no Mac, Mac support for the MLP package. So the moment tensor potentials and the MP2. So that's a Vila Parinello style potentials. So those can only be included on, on Linux. And I guess we, we need certain fixes to build the, the, the Python interface to be compatible with Condor, but in the end, we, we do a serial build followed by a, a parallel build and, and building the library. All basically, all, all the steps are visible there. Right, so the, the advantage here, is, or what I find really powerful, is where you can look at other codes. How did another code use CMake to, to build their code? What were maybe variables that, that we needed to include? And maybe another thing that we can mention here, if you look at something like, like LAMS, you will find that we build for, for diff, different distributions of these packages. In particular, we build for both MPI versions, so that no matter which MPI version the user prefers, we, we build the separate packages there. So that's what can be specified in the Conda build config. And I guess the rest, so we, we have a couple of patches where we modify the LAMS code to work with the, with the Conda part. We also have a, a meta.yaml file, some more packages, a patches, and then we run our tests as like an, an external part, in particular to, to get the, the open MPI configured correctly so that we can import LAMS just to say, okay, importing LAMS works, and then also to, to see that the um, MLIPI, which I guess, uh, yeah, who was talking, or I guess Drew is currently using it to get, to get the implementation of the, of the JAX part, right, so to run Python code from within LAMS to calculate their, their descriptors and, and get this in, just to, to test that this plugin is also working and, and we can activate this. Good, maybe I can now jump back. Oh, my, my build failed. Maybe I did something wrong. What did I do wrong? Um, so, uh, there. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I should have practiced this. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. So we do this again. We just remove the space and then let the build run. Maybe because uh, the build of a Python package is anyway not so interesting, we can take a look at how the process of building LAMS looks like if we do this in the cloud. So you can see once, once the pull request is merged, there will be a robot which creates the separate repository. So here the this LAMS feedstock. So these, these recipes to build packages in the Conda Verge terms are, are called feedstocks. Um, so we can now take a look here. And you will see that we, we compile many different versions of LAMS depending on, on the dependencies. So here we, we build MPI using the MPage version, then we have a specific version of NumPy, and we have a specific version of, of, of Python. And we can now look into this. And I guess it already gives you like a, a good indication how much resources we, we burn. So there's, there's definitely some agreement between the Condor Forge people and Microsoft saying we, 
We support this extensively to be able to do two-hour builds, and you can see like how many two-hour builds we, we do to, to build on Apple ARM and, and all the different combinations. Um, we can take a look at one of those, and then if you just jump to the, the right steps. So it's just starting by setting up the environment as, as we specified it, it's applying all the patches that, that we defined, I guess, so far very similar like, like what you would do locally. It's extracting the downloads, applying some more patches. The important part comes here where certain environment variables are specified. So if you, well, what we see with, with a lot of scientific packages, the make script directly says, okay, call GCC. Just making the assumption GCC is the, the standard compiler, that's something that we would have to patch to, to make it compatible, right? So like, there's a, a CC variable that, that is defined here, which is basically a link to our, our compiler just to make sure that we use the compiler that comes with Condor and not the compiler that comes with, with the Docker image that we build inside. You also find this for, for other variables. Um, maybe most notably, we, we find the, the CPP flags, so just the, the, the flags that we provide during the compilation and, and so on. That makes sense that we, or where we have to be a bit careful that these are correctly propagated to the code during the compilation. Um, yeah, and then you can see, okay, it's, it's detecting the parts, so we do our make config, and then we do the, the build process. That takes a bit of time. So I will just run through the very end. We build multiple of those. And we install the Python package. We can get some statistics, how much memory was used, how, how complex was the build, how, how much time it took. And it's automatically doing some, some analysis of, of which libraries are referenced. It finds out, okay, what are the links of our libraries, where, where they use them. And I guess I should be able to show you. No. Okay, they hide this now. So basically, the, the, the trick that Conda is using to, so for you to be install, able to install it into any directory is that they use patch elf to update the library paths inside the compiled executable. With this, we will get this kind of universal executable and no longer hard coding the paths where we find a specific library. Good, oh, I guess I'm already running out of time, so maybe let me switch back to the, to the presentation. Um, I will just make this very quick, right? So, <laughs> We talked about the, the Conda part. You can look up all the packages, how they are built. I did a lengthy demonstration how, how I built the packages. I have slides just for you to, to summarize this, right? So these are the, the steps that we went through. We, we created the first meta file. I showed you the, the build as H script. Uh, and then for, for Windows, we have a, a build.bot script and we have a, a script for the tests. Okay. Yeah, I guess I don't go to the details here. You find them on the slides as a reference. So for, if somebody wants to, to look this up, you find the slides there. And if you have any questions or struggle to get your code on Condor, feel free to, to contact me during this week or also afterwards. I'm very happy to, to support this. Oh. Yeah, so I skip this part. We open our pull request. That's what we also went through, right? So I feel that Condor is very easy to, to approach because they have a lot of documentation online and everything is happening on GitHub. So you can take a look at this pull request, but you can also take a look at what did other people do with a pull request? We can just search in the Condor organization. Did other people have a similar error message like, like what I have just to see how did other people struggle and really have this kind of, of yeah, joint knowledge from, from the community to really benefit from there. And so the pull request contains the instructions how we can submit the package and what are the steps to take care of. We looked into the continuous integration. I show this here. Um, the, the review process, so part of the review process is automated. If you say, okay, my package is now ready, all the tests are passing, I'm fine with it, I can just call a, another command. This again will trigger a robot to say, we mark this pull request as ready for review, and then a real person comes over and says, okay, takes a look at it. Is this something reasonable? Are you trying to, to publish a commercial code on an open source license? Or is there something where, where they say, okay, that's not what we want on Condor Forge. But they are very relaxed. They allow many things, but there are certain things they just can't allow to, to get on there. And so there's a lot of robots. Also, but during the, the maintenance process of them maintaining a package, there are a lot of GitHub robots um, working there. 
the demand features. Yeah, that's maybe something I should have shown. Building these files and just copying metadata can be quite tedious, right? So <laughs> that's what we also learned. And the, I guess the, the Condor Forge community has a very similar feeling there. Whenever we can automate it, we want to automate it, right? So like, there's a script, you can install this. Grayscale is a very powerful package. Just a single line will create you the same file that we now spend half an hour to create. So maybe just to, to show how good this works, I will try to demonstrate this quickly so that if you really do your first package, I maybe want to save you a bit of trouble. So as it's a, a lab laptop, I have to load my proxy, which is something you don't have to do. We say where we get the package from, GitHub or PyPy, just say PyPy. It's going through all the steps. It's downloading the metadata. It's executing the ex this part, checks the compatibility, figures out the dependencies, figures out the license, tells us what to put in there. We create a new folder. That's the Pyron folder here. I can navigate into this folder. And we can see the meta file that we just created, right? So it's going to do all this automatically. So there's a huge motivation in the Condor Forge community to automate more and more of the task of creating packages. Still, I think it makes sense to once go through the steps manually, but if you want to have like move a lot of packages over to PyPy, Grayscale is definitely a very powerful tool. Good, yeah. So there's a lot of automation and, and really the, the idea of automating the packaging process so that for us as developers, we really have to spend less time on this and still make these executables available for the greater community. Yeah, I talked a bit about the, the C++ codes um, in the example of LAMS. Again, here the, the variables. So, so prefix is the variable where Conda is installing all the libraries too. So if, you're, if you hard code the path where you're, you, want, you want your software to be installed, maybe that's something you have to patch as well to, so to slightly modify. Everything has to go into the, the path specified by prefix. This way Conda can identify, okay, what was installed and which, which should go into the package. Yeah, and then they're using patch elf to, to really update the path and, and link the libraries. Good, the maintenance. Um, yeah, once the pull requests merge, we, we get these recipes. We, we talked about the knowledge base, so that's condaforge slash docs. That's very important. So you, you find all the tricks that I showed now in this very short presentation. Also on there, there are many commands. There's a lot of explanation how to interact with the different robots, what kind of commands you can send them, where you can get help, and so on. Um, this one part, like getting the package in is the first step. The second step is, is keeping it compatible to other libraries, right? So if, if one of your dependencies upgrades, maybe they change the library, you also want to, want to change this. There are certain packages in the Python community, in particular switching between Python versions, where all the packages which need to be compiled need to be then again tested if they work with the other Python package. So that's in the Conor Forge terms, that's called migrations. You can find an overview of the active migration under Condorforge status, and you can basically see that we're nearly through with the Python 3.11 migration. So there's always progress of, of moving the packages over and, and saying that they're still compatible. Yes. So this brings me to my summary. I hope I was able to give you a rough introduction to the Condorforge community. Um, I showed you very briefly how we can contribute packages. I hope that some of you are now motivated to contribute their own package. So feel free to reach out to me during the workshop or also afterwards. And um, what I really enjoy about the Condorforge community is how much time they spend on automating the process of maintaining the packages and really trying to, to free us from this load. With this, I'd like to thank you for your attention.